Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Okay, go in your Bibles this morning, though, to another passage that is about... Uh, ladies and wives in particular. Go to 1 Peter. We're going to start in chapter 2. We want to get the context of this today. And then I trust that this will speak to everybody, not just ladies, but all of us. I thank God that the culture, the nation of America, and other many other nations have a, an, a day of honoring mothers. We thank God. I thought Sister uh, Elizabeth did excellent as she prayed. and Thank God for her mom. And then also... Sister Sonia, but um, we don't want to, I don't want the guys to just sit here and say, well, I'm not going to pay attention today because this isn't for me. <laughs> well, it's too late, huh? <laughs> some, some of you, no, I'm just kidding. First Peter chapter 2, and look at verse 18, you who are slaves. That's how the New Living starts the... Uh, 18th verse of chapter 2. And we know, and the King James is very similar, we understand that the Bible is not teaching slavery or slave ownership. The Bible's not even endorsing it. The Bible's recognizing it. That wherever two people are, one wants to be master over the other. <laughs> That'd have been a good place to slide an amen in there. That's just human nature. Have you had children? Uh, somebody is going to try, and that little brood of kids is going to try and make sure that everybody else in the ho household knows that they are master. If you don't believe me, come here during the week and watch Sister Kathy's daycare. <laughs> I was sitting at my desk the other day. I heard my side door open. I saw two eyes looking at me over top the conference table. Then the door went back closed. <laughs> Whoever it was, this little person was only about table high. <laughs> they did not identify themselves for fear that they might be in trouble. I believe they had made a wrong turn. Or they were hoping to do something disastrous in my office while I was not there. Unfortunately for them, I was there. <laughs> you who are slaves must accept the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I just added that because the Bible says we are slaves to him. Amen. You must accept the authority of your masters with all respect. Do what they tell you, not only if they are kind and reasonable, but even if they are cruel. Wow, God is tough, isn't he? For God is pleased with you when you do what you know is right and patiently endure unfair treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He's your example, and you must follow in his steps. So for all of us who often are seduced by life into believing that the only time we have to really live a life that exemplifies Jesus Christ is when we're in ministry in some other country, let me, let me remind you that here the Holy Spirit teaches us that is our responsibility to live a Christ-like life all the time, especially in day-to-day -day activities. And even when we are being put on, put over, pushed down by those around us, just in normal life, it could be at your job, it could be at some cultural event, and in this we find the will of Jesus for us. Hmm. He never sinned. Verse 21 closes, he is your example, and you must follow in his steps. Here's the example, he never sinned, nor ever deceived anyone, 22. 
He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He may not judge quickly, but he judges fairly. That's the challenge for my flesh. I know he judges fairly. I want him to judge quickly. Like when you've messed with me, I want the hammer to fall now. Hello? Oh, I'm the only one? Huh? Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, but he judges fairly, and his justice may delay, but it will come. Verse 24, he personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed, hallelujah. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. So let's keep in mind here the context of what the Holy Spirit's saying. Verse 18, you who are slaves must accept the authority of your masters with all respect. Now, verse 8, or excuse me, verse 7 of chapter 3, in the same way. That you have to see that. This is connected. As Peter is talking about the reality of slavery in our world, until Jesus Christ returns, until he returns and sets up his kingdom on earth and is the governor and king over all the nations on the entire earth. Hallelujah. Until that day, there will be slavery here on the earth. That does not mean we should not oppose it and fight against it. We should as believers. But the reality is, like the poor, we will have it with us because it's sinister. It's satanic. It will always be bubbling up. But even when the kingdom comes, there will be slaves. For all who have yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ, for all who follow him are in a part of serving him and leading him and reigning with him, you will not be in slavery. But for everybody else, oh yeah. That's why at the end of the thousand years they rebel. So for all of your loved ones who say, you know, I get this whole thing about Jesus coming back, but I'm just going to hold tight here with my life the way it is. I'm just going to keep on the way I am, destroying and being destroyed. I'm just going to do this because I don't want to yield to Jesus Christ till I see him return and win. Even if I go through the tribulation, you might want to tell them, listen, you make it through and you get into that kingdom, you're going to be a slave. Because in that day it will be the haves and the have-nots. And for everybody who has Jesus, you'll be saying, glory to God. Man, this glorified body is awesome. Huh? I tell everybody right now, I love that in 1 Corinthians 15, the New Living Translation. These bodies disappoint us now. Come on, these bodies disappoint us now. But there's a day coming when the body we have will no longer disappoint us. It won't make us sick. It won't make us discouraged. It won't make us diseased or deformed. It will be absolutely perfect and glorious in every way. And we will be a part of his kingdom. And we will be ruling and reigning with him, governing the entire world. And those who have rejected him all through, but who have slipped through the tribulation, those two, three, four, five people, as they begin to repopulate the earth, are going to be treated. Well, that's not my message. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as, your, as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. In the same way. So Peter helps us to understand here, the Holy Spirit is conveying to us that we have to think within the context of slavery because we are slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the way we live right now. The unbeliever does not. They do not live as slaves to Jesus Christ. We get in trouble in the church when we are trying to legislate, we are trying to somehow stipulate that the unbeliever live as a slave to Jesus Christ and we get to be free. The Bible teaches that we are the slaves to Jesus Christ and they are right now free. And when the trumpet sounds... In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that reverses. And we are free. Hallelujah. Yeah, hey, there's a blessing for living this life. Glory to God. There's a reward for being a follower of the king. Okay, go to, go to chapter 3, verse 1 now. In the same way. You see that phrase? 
we read 18 through 25 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. And so when we read this phrase, we have to know the context. What's he talking about? He's talking about slavery. He's talking about how Jesus Christ lived basically as a slave to the will of God. He didn't care what happened to him. I mean, I'm sure he did. But he just said God's will be done every day. He said that when he was healing the multitudes. He said it when he was walking on water. He said it when he was carrying the cross. And he said it when he was dying on the cross. God's will be done. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands, then even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Number one today, my title is Living Successfully. Living Successfully Without. Number one, Living Successfully Without Words. Does anybody believe this is possible? Can, can I, is it possible for me to live successfully without words? No. I, I, I struggle with this, and if you're breathing, you probably struggle with it too. When am I supposed to talk and when am I not, not supposed to talk? I have made my life, my vocation, my living basically off of words for 35 years. If anything happens to my voice, I... I have no doubt you'll care for me for a week or two. You'll celebrate my ministry, and then you'll put me on a shelf and say, that was a good season, who's next? (laughs) Peter says that for ladies, there's this struggle because so often spiritually in the home, there can be some type of, of conflict, there can be some sort of pull, of disagreement, of lack of absolute conformity and unanimity. But in that, Peter says there's a way that you can live successfully even without words. Oh. Oh. It's funny that we often, I don't know how true this is, but we often think of the ladies as being the more talkative gender the more talkative between ladies and men. I'm not sure how that applies in 2021 with some women being men and some men being women. I I don't know what got carried over and switched and unwired and rewired. I I don't know if anybody has that figured out yet. But I'm sure that somebody will write a book about it and tell that I used to be a man, now I'm a woman, and here's how much I talk and I don't talk and I used to talk. Isn't it sad that we live in that? There are days that I look at our world and think, that's it. I don't even want to be in the ministry anymore because I, I, don't, I don't know how to convey the principles of, of loving Jesus to a culture that can't tell whether to use this restroom or that restroom. It used to be that they would, in nature, the culture would say to nature, look, here within nature is an example of same gender relationships because they looked high and low, far and wide, to find something that would say it's not against nature to be in a same gender marriage. Make believe marriage. There's, there's some, but now we've gone way, like light years beyond that. And so they're looking even further into nature to say there are, there are examples in nature of those who don't know uh, whether they are um, male or female. But they haven't found it yet because even nature knows that. Isn't it interesting that Paul uses that argument so much in Romans chapter 1 about nature? Nature. That even nature, the unbeliever can look directly at nature and see the evidence of God. And so there's a constant assault against nature and the God that's created it. And you and I live in that culture. But Peter says through the anointing and power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit that there's a way to live successfully without words in the same way. Now, how do we do that? Ladies and gentlemen, how do we do that? It doesn't mean you shouldn't talk at all, right? Because 
Obviously, I'm talking. And, and what would life be if nobody said anything? But the emphasis here is on how to influence somebody, how to win them, how to pull them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, the Lord himself said, it's often the case, I added that phrase, but that the children of this world are more wise than the children of the kingdom. And I think in one of those ways is that the world understands how to use words to bring influence, how to use words to bring people into what you feel and sense and see and know. Believers, we need to be so familiar, not so much with knowing chapter and verse of God's word, but knowing the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can bring influence to somebody's life. That's why I always like having Brother Ken Gobb here. He's older and but I love those stories. I love his single-minded nature about telling people of Jesus Christ, about constantly looking for opportunities to win them even if he can't use a word. Peter, speaking of a specific, particular situation which may have been quite widespread in the early church, much as it is even today, and that is that ladies ended up in the church. Ladies were born again, one to the Lord Jesus Christ, and their husbands were not, or perhaps something happened that um, they were already a believer, and uh, they thought the husband was a believer, but come to find out after marriage, well, he's not really a believer. And Here's what Peter says. Listen, you can be a person of influence. They will be, verse, beginning of verse 2 or end of verse 1, they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. We have to be so careful that we don't become re reverent about the culture or reverent about politics or reverent about positions. We have to be so careful because we don't have opportunities that are unlimited to influence people for Jesus Christ. We have to be careful. And if we bring mixture into our message, people will never hear the message. They will leave because of the mixture. We have to be reverent about the things of God. We have to understand that nothing competes or compares. Nothing can be brought into that dough or it messes the whole lump up. I need to know Jesus that way, and I can guarantee you that I don't yet. But I want to be on the path to knowing him that way. Amen? Here's the second thing. Look at verse 3 now. Don't be concerned about the outward beauty or fancy, excuse me, of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. It's funny that 2,000 years later, these things are still a part of us, right? You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. This is how the holy women of old made themselves beautiful. They trusted God and accepted the authority of their husbands. Number one. We can live successfully without words. Now listen, you and I can't do that without the Holy Spirit. It cannot be done except the power of the Holy Spirit. Number two, we can live successfully without concern. Ladies, Peter says that, well, the Holy Spirit says, that, that they don't need to be concerned. You don't need to be concerned. Now obviously he's not saying don't wear anything. I, I think that's self-evident. I think there are many other places in the Word of God where it demonstrates that we should wear clothes. Hallelujah. We'll just leave it at that. I don't think any opinion, any commentary from the peanut gallery here is needed. So I think also he's not saying that you can't do anything on the outward. There have been seasons in Pentecost, in churches like ours, and even to this day in churches like ours, where it's unfortunately usually geared towards women, but there's this thought that if you do anything outwardly, you're sinning against God. But when you read the ladies he's referring to, Sarah, her husband was the wealthiest man on earth. But let's talk specifically, for an example, about her daughter-in-law, Rebecca. Because when the servant, when Abraham's servant went to find a wife for Isaac, what did he take? About 300 camels full of jewelry. He gives the whole family jewelry, but when Rebecca says, yes, I will be your master's son's wife, he says, oh, do I have good news for you. You just hit the lottery. 
And he opens up the saddlebags and he starts putting rings on her and bracelets on her. It mentions the bracelets on her legs and ankles. It mentions the ring in her nose. It mentions all the things in her hair. And you and I have to realize that's who Peter's identifying for us as an example. So what does he mean? I think that we could easily say he's not telling us no jewelry. But he's telling us that if believers decorate the body more than the soul, there will be spiritual trouble and failure. This is the, uh, the guy who's at the gym but is never on his knees praying. This is the guy who's always at work making more success in money, but never fasting. Huh? Come on. Listen, this body is temporary. It is passing away. You and I have to have confidence that God has given us a body that's adequate. Should we care for it? Uh, I guess to an extent. uh, The Bible says in the King James, bodily exercise profits little. It doesn't say that it profits none. He says that no man ever yet hated his own body or his own flesh. So you and I understand that God has given us to care. He's given us the, the concern. He's given us the privilege of having this body, but he's not given us the assignment to focus on the body to the exclusion of the soul. And when people are convinced they are of the wrong gender, you will always hear them say, I'm in the wrong body. I'm trapped in the wrong body. Uh, You're not trapped in the wrong body. Your soul is ill. And your soul needs something powerful. Your soul needs something from heaven above. But pastor, I know people that love God. I know people that love him and they they just can't deal with everything. Listen, when you begin to know more about the other person than God, you let me know. We've heard it for a thousand years. Well, I'd love to serve God, but I don't understand why he has starving people in Africa. I don't understand why he lets girls be abused and blown to pieces over here in Afghanistan. If there's really a God of love, listen, you have one responsibility. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Well, pastor, who are you to be so judgmental? Who are you to tell people? I'm here to influence people to look to the king of glory. I can't change you. I can't help you know what your gender is. I can't convince you that you're in the right body. All I can tell you is Jesus Christ loves you with an everlasting love. He died for you on the cross and shed his blood. On the third day, God raised him from the dead, and the power that dwells in him dwells richly in you. And if that power that raised him from the dead is in you, you'll know who you are. You are his in Christ Jesus. You are his 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 does that mean you'll feel comfortable every day about who you are no you probably will not does that mean you'll have an explanation for everything no but I can guarantee you you will not feel the same at 80 in your body that you feel when you're 18 so be careful what you convince yourself of when you're 18 because you're on your way to being 80 and some things you do to your body can be irreversible That's what I'm telling you. I'm not here to tell you you're this, you're that. I'm not here to tell you what color socks to wear, this or that I don't love you. I love you, but I don't love you as much as God loves you. But don't ever tell me that God isn't good, God isn't grace-filled, that God doesn't care because you know somebody that loves him and their life is still this, that, or the other. He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him now and always. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I can't help what the culture thinks. I can't help what MTV thinks. Is MTV still a thing? (laughs) Do they have MTV? I don't even know. But it was a thing back in the day. And they had music videos on there. All right, Pastor, how'd you get here with Mother's Day? Good Lord. (laughs) If believers decorate the body, I've got blanks there for you if you're following the notes. If believers decorate the body more than the soul, there will be spiritual trouble and eventually failure. So just make sure there's balance. Make sure you're not out in anything, right? We can't get out of balance. And I, it troubles me that sisters seem to always, kids always take the brunt of everything. We were talking to somebody the other day was mentioning this about COVID, and it's so true. You know, everything, all the studies now are beginning to show, and we knew this. The kids are suffering because they were at home. 
They weren't allowed to have a friend, talk to anybody, do anything but breathe through a mask with an oxygen tank connected right to them. I've told you from day one, we've not mocked this, con- this uh, coronavirus. We've not made fun of it. We've not denied it. We haven't said it doesn't exist, all that. But we also recognize that there's still life. And we have to navigate through every challenge that comes. Listen, coronavirus isn't the worst thing we're going to face here soon. Big fight for $15 an hour for everybody. $15, I told you two or three years ago, I'm fighting for $50 an hour. Because here we are, by the time you get $15 an hour, it ain't even going to buy a hamburger. We've got a superheated economy now, and we're in trouble, big trouble. That's for another day. Here's the third thing. I love 10 o'clock because as long as you're out before 2.30, it feels early, doesn't it? (laughs) Here's the third and final thing. Look at verse 6, one verse. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband, there she is, Abraham, and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Number one, we can live successfully, ladies and gentlemen, without words. As long as we love Jesus, right? We can live successfully without concern. We don't have to worry about the culture. We don't have to be overly concerned about having the right style or the right this or that. Listen, nobody, I love you know, shirts that are, that are decorative or some people would say loud. But uh, <laughs> that's your choice. That's your business. That's your opinion. I like Paisley. Always have, always will. Have you seen, I mentioned a few weeks ago, we got some, uh, Pastor Salvador showed me this thing, this guy's got a website about sneakers and preachers. And uh, I guess he's got all the names on there, the ones that have, you know, $1,000 sneakers. I didn't know you could buy sneakers for $1,000. Well, I know why I didn't know, but um, even if I wanted to, I wouldn't. I don't think I would. But I might pay something, I might pay 1000 for something else that you wouldn't. That doesn't make me right and you wrong, right? How we how we live in this life and how we spend what God has given us is kind of personal. And the way you spend it or what you value might be completely different than what I value. But I know that I treasure above all else my relationship with the King of glory, Jesus Christ. That's what I value above all else. And the Holy Spirit keeps me focused on that. He just brings me back to that. When I feel like I'm going too far, he brings me back to that. When I say, oh, I'm just not sure, he brings me back to that. We were, um, Pam, Sister Pam and I were on vacation there a couple of weeks ago, and there was a golf course right there at the resort we stayed at, which is part of why we stayed at that resort. And I had cut my thumb really bad a few days before. And uh, I said, <clears throat> I'm not going to get stitches because I want to be able to swim in the ocean, but I also wanted to play golf. And um, so finally, on the last day we were there, I felt like I can do this, I can play golf. So I go in and I remember I don't, I don't have any golf shoes with me. I'm going to rent golf clubs, but I don't have any golf shoes. They're $160 in their golf store for golf shoes. And I've got them in my hand. And they feel like they're worth $160. And I say, Lord Jesus, I can justify this. I can. And, and I, can, I can explain. I, I've got an excuse. And then I finally realized, well, no, I still got to buy golf balls. I got to buy a glove. I gotta buy. So I, and I didn't, the design, the style, I didn't like real well and the size that they had for me. And so I didn't get them. <clears throat> Ended up, I spent almost that on golf balls because I was hitting them here or there. <laughs> The Lord says, good enough for you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I did have those golf shoes in my hands. But what you, what you say is valuable. I want to buy that. I want to I spend my money on that. If, if God doesn't give you a red light, hallelujah. But don't do anything to jeopardize your soul. Verse 6, let's read it again. Same way. For instance, Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Number three, we can live successfully without fear. I do believe this is intentionally, specifically for my sisters. I know that all of us have fear. All of us face things that are, uh, induce fear in us. But I want to talk to you who are sisters. I don't, I'm not 
a sister, so I can't speak from experience, but I watch you, observe you. I have a mother, I have a wife, I have a daughter, and I have a church full of ladies that I admire and respect and adore, and I love how God uses you and what God's doing in you and through you and for you. But one of the things that I believe Jesus wants to give you is a confidence when you face fear, an ability to understand, to first of all discern and identify fear. It can be at work. It can be in the context of, of the environment that you put yourself in. We're seeing more and more <clears throat> in our culture an exposure of just how bad things have been at our core for two generations. I saw somebody, it was a headline last night or this morning, and this was a, a movie star person or somebody like that. I, don't, I didn't read the article. I don't even remember. I probably shouldn't even quote it. But basically the gist was that every, every girl, every young woman that has grown up in America in the last 40 years or whatever has been sexualized and had advances as a young teenager. And I thought, number one, if that's true, my heart's broken. But number two, how can it not be? Because as a culture, we embraced pornography in the 1960s. Everything was going to be wonderful. We were going to build a culture on free love. It was going to be incredible. And really all it was was free abuse. And out of that now has come this culture that is absolutely damaging and destroying. But we don't have any power to extricate ourselves from it. We've sold ourselves. And I'm talking about America. I'm not talking about this church. I'm not talking about you. But I'm talking about as a nation. We've identified things that we value culturally. We've said this is important to my soul. And those things are anything but Jesus Christ. And look at the price we're paying for it. Look at the absolute incredible price. Law enforcement people tell us all the time that what's the most shocking thing right now is human trafficking, especially of women and girls in nations around the world, including America. How can we be surprised? This is what we went after. This is the God we worshiped for the last 40 years. This is the idol that we bowed down before, and now we're paying the price because that God that first said, come and worship me, now says, come and let me be your Lord and Master. And let me destroy you. Moms and dads, let's, if you're a single mom or your grandparents raising your little girl, if you didn't see it Wednesday night, you can still get online and see what Brother Steve Fitzhugh said, how he raised his daughters constantly saying to them, you are so fine. Because he said, I never wanted them to need a young man to, or an older man to tell them that. We have to raise our girls with value. Now listen, I know the culture preaches that. I know everybody believes that. But only the believer understands how to do that, how to bring security in, put a wall, have protection, to really focus on the value not only of our guys but of our gals. The Bible says the New Testament, Sister Sherry did a great job, I think it was her uh, a month or so ago on Wednesday nights, talking about that how revolutionary that was, that both men and women have equal value in the kingdom of God. Oh, praise God that the Lord Jesus Christ said, I am for you, I'm not against you. You have value and I want to use you here, there, and everywhere. Thank God that he loves our daughters. Thank God that Jesus died on the cross for our daughters and not just our sons. Thank God that in the church we don't say, oh, I praise God that I'm not a, a, a female or a slave or a dog. That in the church we say, thank God I am who I am and thank God for my brothers and sisters. That's the church, amen? That's the blood-bought church, hallelujah. She's not a sexual object. She's not property. She's not my punching bag because I don't know how to deal with the rage that's inside of me, the abuse I endured, what I went through, the disappointments, the failures. She's not for me to blame about everything that goes wrong, so I don't have to blame myself because I don't like doing that. She's none of that. She is God's co-heir in the things of grace for me. Hallelujah. I can live without fear. It takes more than the intention of doing right, though, ladies. Having the intention without doing is a sign of fear. 
Let me say that again. Peter said, don't be afraid, not of your husband, not of anybody else, to do right. Now, if this is a really critical situation, you better be prayed up. And you've got Esther as your guide. And you say, listen, I'm about to go and say what I need to say to this husband of mine or this boyfriend of mine or this son of mine. I'm going to tell him that you've stolen the last dime from me you're going to steal. You've broken the last door off the hinges you're going to break. And though the culture won't do anything with you, I'm about to teach you a lesson. This is the end of the line. This is where my love and your rebellion clash. My love's not for sale anymore, and you're not going to trample it in the dirt. This is the end. Until you understand what it means to respect and honor, get out. So I'm praying for all of you ladies who face these kinds of things, or maybe you have a husband that doesn't want you to tithe. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of not only what your husbands might say, but what they might do. But you can only live that way if you go back to verse 1 and that entire text. This is tough. It's difficult. It is altogether a requirement of full surrender. There is no halfway with Jesus Christ. There is no, I'll try it. You got to say, Lord, I'm giving it all to you and I'm trusting you in this situation. Help me. Help me. And he'll do that. Amen. Father, today we thank you for the love of God. We thank you that you help us in every situation. We thank you that you give us strength and power. You carry us through, Lord, when we feel like we can't even walk. We thank you, Lord, that you love us with an everlasting love. We thank you that we are co-heirs together in the things of God, the grace of God. Thank you that Jesus Christ has not only redeemed my sisters, older and younger, related to me and not, those in the church, we have been redeemed together, but he's also elevated them prospered them, gifted them, called them, sent them, anointed them, uses them, speaks to them, encourages them, gives them wisdom. Thank you, Father, that you give my sisters blessing after blessing and that together we are the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Would you, uh, would you stand with me this morning, church? I'm just asking the Lord what I want to do here. And you ladies who feel like you can or would, if you could just... We did a wedding Friday night for Sister Debbie, the former Debbie Unger and her new husband, Mark Kenny. And we do a hand blessing in the wedding. And we say to the, to the bride first, take, take the hands of your husband and hold them palms up so that you can see the gift they are to you. Ladies, you're a gift to God. Whether you want to raise one hand, halfway, a little way, but I would prefer if you could, would you just, if you are okay with this, would you just put a hand or your hands like this? Father, pour your blessing out on my sisters. The older ones are like mothers to me. The younger ones are like sisters. I pray for mothers. I pray for single mothers, grandmothers. I pray for ladies who have never been married, those who have and are single now, divorced, widowed. Lord, I pray that there would come a blessing on our ladies here at Central like we've never seen before. They've labored here, Lord, at the close of World War I. This church was birthed. There were ladies, multitudes of ladies in the families. And out of that came generations of blessing. 
I pray for, Lord, the generations today, down through the years, we worked as a church in World War II and the canteen and the ladies were there. I pray, Lord, that for the generation now and those to come, that that blessing would remain and that it would multiply. I pray for provision, Lord. May wealth come to my sisters. I pray, Lord, for spiritual wealth, first of all. I pray for financial wealth. Come upon our sisters here at Central. I pray for the blessing of God. Give them, Lord, wisdom and insight. Give them discernment. I pray for their safety and security. I pray for our little sisters, Lord, that you would secure them in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would not be those that suffer through physical, sexual, emotional abuse. God, that they would be protected. Put a wall of protection around them today and every day. Satan, get your hands off of them now and always. We pray for deliverance for our daughters sisters and our mothers for those Lord who have already experienced brokenness, shame, heartache rejection, abandonment I pray that the flood of God's glory the flood of his healing power would come to them and cause them to know that they are healed and restored, bless our sisters, bless, bless, bless in Jesus mighty name hallelujah may that blessing remain praise God